watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. The Federal Judicial Center presents Science in the Courtroom, a series of programs for judges on science and scientific evidence. Program 2, Recombinant DNA and Gene Cloning. This lecture by Edward S. McCarsky, Jr., Professor of Microbiology and Immunology at Stanford University School of Medicine, builds on his presentation in Program 1 of this series, Core Concepts of Microbiology. Hello and welcome. This lecture on recombinant DNA and gene cloning will continue to expand core concepts of microbiology that have entered into the courtroom. In my first lecture, I presented an introduction to molecular biology, covering the way in which the four bases of DNA are arranged into a code and how they're replicated, that is, copied or reproduced. I also discussed the flow of information that gives rise to gene expression, including how an intermediate messenger RNA is transcribed from a DNA template and how this messenger is itself a template for the synthesis or translation of proteins. Proteins make up most of the structures and carry out metabolic processes central to life. The common language or DNA code makes it possible to recombine or take DNA from one organism and move it into another. Such recombinant DNA approaches have changed the way biology research is carried out and opened the way for a new industry, biotechnology. Biotech is a commercial child of recombinant DNA. Moving DNA from higher organisms, like humans, to bacteria can provide an unlimited supply of such things as therapeutic proteins, insulin, growth hormone. Modifications of genes in organisms, such as the plant rice, has led to new variants that contain a more balanced source of essential amino acids. So today's lecture will deal with these basic recombinant DNA and gene cloning methods. The first slide summarizes the core concepts we'll try to cover. First off, and this is mostly from last time, the genetic code is universal. That is to say, DNA and the four bases that make up DNA are common to all organisms. The arrangement of those bases, the order of those bases, dictate the differences in organisms. Bacteria, which are a simple organism, prokaryote, exchange DNA in nature. And this is actually one of the first and really important principles that came up in experimental studies that allowed us to appreciate that you could move DNA from one organism to another. Bacteria exchange DNA and exchange, for example, antibiotic resistance markers. So they can acquire a resistance to an antibiotic in happens in livestock, happens in, in therapies that are applied to uh, patients in hospitals. Plasmids are DNA molecules that carry these resistance markers and, are naturally, and naturally occur in nature. Gene cloning has allowed us to take those DNA plasmids and modify them or design them to carry or to transfer new DNA molecules in, into them. The bacteria that are most popular are called Escherichia coli. They were the first to be engineered or used for recombinant DNA, and they're still the lab favorite. Human proteins, and I think this is the most important area, human proteins have been and continue to be expressed in bacteria as a way to create an abundant supply of important therapeutic uh, uh, proteins. So a human protein coding sequence can be taken and inserted into a bacterial context and allow that bacteria to then act as a fact. It tricks the bacteria into producing essentially a, pro a foreign protein, a protein that's of no use to the bacterium but can be of commercial use. So we'll go through these core concepts uh, today. Next slide. So first, there's a natural tendency of bacteria to exchange DNA. And again, the most poignant example of that is antibiotic resistance. Uh, we all know that antibiotics that were useful years ago are no longer useful, either in hospitals or in various settings, even in li livestock, because resistance has arisen. 
Well, the resistance markers are carried on plasmids, as I say, small DNA molecules. This movie is a cartoon, as it were, to illustrate the exchange of DNA from one bacteria to another. As you see, this armored bacterium who comes in from the right is uh, suited up and can defend himself against an antibiotic. And he just transferred something to the other bacteria. And now we're going to slow that down and watch it in slow motion. The, if you watch closely, you see a sort of a white circle fly out of his head and hit one guy nearby. And then that fellow also throws off a bunch of white circles that get transferred to everyone else. That's meant to depict the exchange of a plasmid from one bacterium of it to another. If we just go through it one more time, we can appreciate that uh, the process is, is, is colorful and actually occurs pretty much that way in nature. DNA exchange is quite free in bacteria. So that one bacterium, for example, living in your gut, in your intestine, can exchange a plasmid with another bacterium that's also living in the same environment. And that can give rise to resistance to commonly used uh, uh, antibiotics, such as ampicillin. As we're watching the movie, you can see a diagram of a, of a plasmid off to the left there with ampicillin R, ampicillin resistance, sort of written along its, its side. Plasmids are small DNA molecules, circular, that ha can have a couple of genes, but most importantly have a gene that encodes a protein or enzyme that can degrade a particular uh, antibiotic, such as ampicillin. So ampicillin is a drug. Beta-lactamase is an enzyme that can break that drug apart, and beta-lactamase would be encoded by an ampicillin resistance uh, gene on a plasmid. If we go on, so this, this ability to have plasmids and select for bacteria that carry plasmids using antibiotics, antibiotic resistance, is a core concept as well. It allows us to take a mixture of bacteria, for example, in a laboratory, introduce a plasmid into a select few of them and grow them out of a population because they're resistant to a particular antibiotic, whereas the, the members of the population that lack the plasmid are susceptible to that antibiotic. And this, is, this slide is meant to depict this process. So on the left, on the top, you see a bacterial cell, sort of an oblong uh, image, with two DNA molecules shown inside of it. One is the bacterial chromosome. It's shown larger. It's actually a very large circle. And the other, a small circular plasmid. That plasmid has ampicillin resistance on it. It's been acquired by that bacterium, but not by that bacterium immediately to the right. So when we apply ampicillin to a, to a population that includes bacteria that have the plasmid or that lack the plasmid, only the ones that carry the plasmid will grow and propagate. And in fact, that's a key concept to being able to isolate a particular DNA molecule. In this case, it's just a natural occurring bacterial plasmid, but nonetheless, it allows a clone of bacteria to be grown out as a colony, and we'll talk more about that, and essentially identified by a scientist and taken and used. So only plasmids that carry the antibiotic resistance marker will grow out when the antibiotic is present in the growth medium in a laboratory setting. And so that's used uh, in practical terms to help uh, a scientist grow out a particular bacterium. If we go to the next slide, this shows a time course of E. coli, Escherichia coli growth. These are actual micrographs, they're black and white images, taken in a time sequence going from left to right in the three uh, rows across. You see we start with three bacteria on the little rods on the, uh, on the upper left. As time goes by, approximately every 20 to 30 minutes, each of those bacteria divide. They're in the presence of nutrients, that food that they can live on, grow. And so they divide. And by the end of a period of time, shortly l less than two hours, I believe, they end up forming a kind of colony of bacteria. This would still be microscopic. It wouldn't be visible to the naked eye. But if we continue this process for another eight or 10 hours, if we go to the next slide, we see that the colony now, it's at lower magnification, so you can't really see the individual bacteria. 
but you can see they've piled up into a very large aggregate. And eventually, this reaches a size that can be visualized without any magnification on a, on a uh, growth surface. And so in the laboratory, growing out colonies of bacteria are, have been used in many settings. I mean, diagnostics, for example, if you have a strep throat, and you go to the doctor and you want to know if it's a strep throat, they'll put a swab in your throat, they'll streak it out onto a bacterial plate that has medium and look for a particular kind of bacterium by growing out colonies of that bacteria. In that case, the bacteria isn't grown for resistance to any antibiotic, it's just to isolate and identify the bacterium. In the laboratory, we use the bacterial resistance markers, resistance to ampicillin, resistance to other antibiotics as well, to identify and manipulate bacteria. And what I'm leading towards is the ability to use these naturally existing plasmids in order to actually introduce foreign DNA into an organism like bacteria so that the foreign DNA can be carried along and studied or used in various ways. Next slide. So one of the first uses for plasmids in the, in the laboratory came about uh, 25 years ago. And that is when these plasmids, again, that have the antibiotic resistance markers, were found to have the ability to be opened with a kind of enzyme, a protein that could recognize a particular base sequence and actually cut through the double-stranded DNA and leave open ends. What's shown here is the restriction enzyme, which is the name for that protein, ECOR1. ECOR1 is just a name of one of the kinds of restriction enzymes that are available. And there are hundreds of these now available to scientists. ECOR1 recognizes and cuts through DNA at the site GAATTC. And on the opposite strand is CTTAAG, their base pairs. And that's what's shown on the upper left here. So after cutting the plasmid with ECOR1 and taking any other DNA and exposing it to that enzyme, ECOR1 sites are digested, cut, left, with, with, left open. Those two can be, those two fragments can be brought together and recom recombined into a single, now circular molecule that's a recombinant DNA molecule. It was not something that existed in nature. It's something that was made in a laboratory, made in a test tube, and yet can still be put back into bacteria and propagated, in fact, cloned. The term cloning means taking an individual plasmid and inserting an individual new piece of DNA and isolating that as a pure clonal population. So very important to the process of recombinant DNA is the, is the need to be able to manipulate DNA by digesting it at particular sites, defined sites, with restriction enzymes. Restriction enzymes like ECOR1 that have a six base recognition site occur naturally in all DNA. They're not special things. Just the fact that DNA sequence exists about once every 500 bases will be an ECOR1 site. So there's actually quite a lot of ECOR1 sites in everyone's DNA in all organisms. Besides being present naturally, though, science, chemists, have figured out ways long ago to make synthesized DNA. And so ECOR1 sites can also be synthetically prepared by chemists and placed in, onto larger DNA molecules. So there's a couple of ways to actually end up having ECOR1 sites available to make an insertion into a particular plasmid. The plasmid then becomes a cloning vehicle or cloning vector. Next slide. So why clone DNA? Okay. Well, one of the earliest reasons was to simply have an abundant supply of any DNA. Uh, it's still a very important reason to have it. In fact, uh, the organization of a complex genome like the human genome cannot be done without cloning the, that large DNA. We talked about that being three billion bases. Our genomes are three billion base pairs. That's an enormously large amount of DNA. It comes in 23 different chromosomes. And in order to study that, it's been cloned. It's been cloned in fragments anywhere from a few hundred base pairs to hundreds of thousands of base pairs in the largest clones that are available. In fact, some are o almost a million base pairs. But the value of having the clonal pieces is they can be then ordered or mapped into, an, into a particular arrangement so we can actually study them and sequence them. 
determine the nucleotide sequence of each of the regions of the human genome. And so the Human Genome Project, that is to say the sequencing of one set of three billion base pairs, is all possible because DNA can be carried in relatively abundant levels in bacteria. And finally, we're going to go into how, it's import how this whole process is important because it allows uh, a scientist to express a foreign protein, such as insulin, uh, in, uh, in a foreign, foreign organism, a bacterium, but that insulin, the protein that would be expressed, is just like its human origin, uh, human original. It's just like the natural protein. And again, this has to do with the universality of the code, the universality of the fact that you can express any DNA segment as long as you give it the right controls. And of course, what I mean by expression is a process of transcription of a DNA template into an mRNA intermediate, and then the translation of that messenger RNA into protein. So in a recombinant DNA setting, the transcription would start at bacterial control sequences and transcribe through the foreign protein encoding sequence. And then the messenger RNA would be read and translated into a foreign protein. So, DNA can be cloned anywhere from a few bases to hundreds of thousands, and this is a very versatile uh, system of using particularly E. coli for this uh, purpose. If we go on now to look at a little more about the restriction enzyme, and again, staying with E. coli R1 as our example. So restriction enzymes are said to cut a site on the DNA. In the case of E. coli R1 down the bottom, you can see that there's a, I've got the double helix cartoon expanded out and there's only six bases shown. Well, that six bases, G-A-A-T-T-C, with its respective base pairs, would be present on a DNA molecule. Exposing that DNA molecule to E. coli R1 would leave what's called a staggered cut, that is to say, a cut that would release the two ends but leave single-stranded four base overhangs. In the, in the case here, it's AATC, AATT on the top strand, and TTAA on the bottom strand. Those so-called sticky ends are what can be used to recombine any other ECOR1 cut DNA into a site. So the, the fact that there's an AATT or a TTAA allows other pieces that end the same way, other DNA fragments that end in the same sort of uh, cut site to be used. They're complementary or compatible ends. And so recombinant DNA, or the recombination in recombinant DNA, is indeed the annealing or the sticking together of these ends that are common on a variety of different DNA fragments. On the one hand, a plasmid that might be opened, and the other, some DNA fragment, say, from humans that carries the insulin gene on the other, together as one. The process of sticking them together requires some enzymatic steps, and those are well established in, in most biological laboratories these days. Next slide. So one of the key things we've already talked about is that clone plasmids allow bacteria to grow out as colonies. And so if you insert a series of fragments, in this case, in this example on the slide, there are four different fragments in our mixture of DNA that's going to be cloned. And what's important is it doesn't matter if that's four fragments, 400 fragments, or 40,000 fragments. After they're introduced into the plasmid, all of those individual variants can be isolated because bacteria take up only one plasmid, and then they grow as a colony. And so out of that mixture of four, as shown here, or 40,000 individual fragment clones ins inserted into the plasmid clones will grow out on a, on a bacterial culture dish, as is shown in this cartoon. Now, those colonies are a lot bigger than they normally would be relative to the culture dish, but it's done this way so you can see that it's a pile of, of bacterial cells. Normally, they're only a, about a couple of millimeters across, and, but they're big enough to see and can be selected and, and used. So, and the process of introducing these plasmids into E. coli is called transformation of E. coli, or transformation of the bacteria. And the bacteria grow, again, 
on a nutrient auger, that's a, a source of growth, it's a sort of solid, so, solid surface on which they can pile up that contains an antibiotic that the plasmid has a resistance marker to. So the resistance marker helps us identify the plasmid and then we look and see which DNA fragment might be cloned into it. So that's the principle of cloning. Next slide. Now, besides being able to just clone DNA into bacteria and have it be a place to carry foreign DNA, a well, very important development is that bacteria can be manipulated to produce foreign proteins. So bacteria go through life, just as we do, expressing their DNA as genes and gene, expressing their genes and gene products and making proteins. So plasmids have genes. We've already talked about one. Uh, ampicillin resistance. Beta-lactamase is a gene on a plasmid. That gene is expressed in E. coli because it has all the appropriate gene expression signals. We talked very briefly about these sorts of signals yesterday. I'll talk more about them today. The E. coli bacteria were the first and remain the most common to be used in a laboratory. And the important control elements besides the protein coding DNA sequence that's moved from humans, the most important control elements are called promoters that are places in the bacterial genome or in a plasmid genome or actually in bacteriophage genome, bacterial virus genome, that have been adapted to be able to control transcription or expression of an RNA intermediate in bacteria that can be used to translate that foreign protein then in in, in a context that's completely foreign to that original gene, the original, let's say, human insulin gene, which would not be expressed in E. coli without having those manipulations. So before I go on, I need to just stop and digress here and show you what a bacteriophage is, because control elements that are used by scientists uh, commonly come from bacterial genomes, from plasmids, and from bacteriophages, and we really haven't talked about bacteriophages up to now. So next slide is a, a movie that depicts one of uh, the most common, commonly used bacteriophages that are infect E. coli. It looks sort of like a, a, a lunar lander, if we just stop the movie for a moment. Uh, the lunar, it looks like a lunar lander. It's very small, as most viruses are, relative to the host cells that they infect. Uh, and here, the host cell, the bacterial cell, is below these three bacteriophage that have landed on the surface of that bacteria. Now what's going to happen here is the bacteriophage, which is a virus, carries its own genome, and in this case it's a DNA genome as well. The DNA genome is packed inside of a protein shell, which is that upper part of the lunar lander. The collar and those legs that it uses to land with are all machinery that it uses to simply inject its genome into those bacteria. So bacteriophage, like these, get around in nature by finding a bacterium and injecting DNA into the bacterium. If we go on with the movie, we'll see what happens then. So the bacteria inject their DNA. Their DNA is expressed because it's recognized as bacteria by the bacterial uh, machinery get proteins, you get progeny uh, bacteriophage. There, there are only about a dozen. In fact, normally when one bacteriophage infects a bacterial cell, you get thousands of progeny, one of the things viruses do very well. And so here we go again. The bacteriophage has landed. They inject their DNA. The virus DNA is expressed. More of the viral proteins are made, assemble into progeny viruses, and then they destroy the bacterial cell and are released to go off and do more damage. The important point here, though, is that these bacteriophage have very strong promoters and control regions that have been used in the laboratory to direct expression of foreign proteins, just as some of the promoters from the bacterial genome and from plasmids have also been used. To get a recombinant protein to be expressed in E. coli, there are some, some, some principles involved. Uh, first off, you can't just use any plasmid. The plasmid has to be modified so that it can be used as an expression vector, what's called an expression vector. An expression vector has one additional component, at least, uh, compared to the, the cloning vehicles we've talked about up to now. The extra piece is a promoter region, here shown in blue, that is adjacent to the site 
into which a human gene, let's say, like insulin, is going to be inserted. So the human gene is going to be inserted into that plasmid, again, using a restriction enzyme like EcoR1 to, to make the recombination. But it's going to be put into a context where there's a bacterial promoter that allows it to be expressed. And we're going to talk a little more about that before we come back to exactly what happens then. In any case, the plasmid is still maintained, just like a plasmid we've talked about before, but now it's got an insert adjacent to a promoter so that as the bacteria are grown, this foreign protein, this new protein, can potentially be made in E. coli. So if we go now and step back and look at the way in which bacterial genes are arranged, they have a sort of hallmark arrangement of both promoter, something called an operator that we haven't spoken about at all yet, and a ribosome binding site. And let me just go through that using this bacterial operon, and the term operon is also new, this bacterial operon, which has three genes. So bacterial genes are often uh, set up into arrangements where there was one promoter, one place where the RNA polymerase starts making a messenger RNA, the DNA shown here on the top strand, on the top line, and the messenger RNA shown just below it, so the process of transcription of messenger RNA is starting from a promoter and proceeds to go through multiple genes so that the messenger RNA has more than one gene carried on it. In each case, the messenger RNA is translated into individual proteins. And so on the messenger RNA, you see little boxes in between each gene, which represent a place for ribosomes. Remember, ribosomes are the protein synthesis machinery. They start protein synthesis. And so mRNA to be read and turned into a protein synthesis requires a ribosome to come in and start to read it. And that's the starting point for reading. And in front of each of those genes, gene Z, gene X, and gene Y, there's a little ribosome binding site box on the, R on the messenger RNA. And each of those genes gives rise to an individual protein. They're shown as a kind of oblong uh, image. So an operon controls the expression of a series of genes. All the genes of an operon are regulated by the same conditions. And some of the most well understood operons in bacteria control things like how the bacteria respond to nutrients, the presence of a particular sugar, for example, in the growth medium or in nature. I mean, bacteria like E. coli live in nature. They live in various places and they look for different nutrients. In the lab, they can be grown on different sugar sources. Two sugars that are used commonly are a sugar called glucose, which we also can use as energy source, uh, and a, a sugar like lactose. Scientists have adapted these regulatory control regions to control the expression of, for example, human insulin in bacteria in a recombinant DNA sense. So if we go to the next slide, it tries to put that together. And this slide is actually just a modification of one we saw uh, three slides ago. So if we look at insulin as an example, we have the promoter operator region, which is the blue region, taken from a natural bacterial operon. And in fact, in the first case where this was done, it was the LAC operon, and it was the LAC promoter operator. So that insulin, the insulin cDNA, once it was inserted into the expression plasmid, which is shown in a top series of three circles, to make the final plasmid expression vector on the right. When that was introduced into E. coli, and when the E. coli were grown under the appropriate conditions to induce expression, and that would be lactose, in the presence of lactose, would induce this expression, insulin was made and could be collected from cells, from these bacterial cells, that would not naturally have ever made that protein. So it's a very important step uh, in commercialization of, of recombinant DNA because at this point in time, which was the late 1970s, uh, there was really no, under, no real understanding of the, the kinds of practical possibilities, although it was well understood that DNA was a universal code. The demonstration that uh, you could express a human protein in bacteria was a major hallmark 
in, uh, in biology, in molecular biology. And since that time, any, a number, any number of different therapeutic proteins have been expressed in this same fashion. If we go to the next slide. So expression in, in, of recombinant proteins in bacteria takes advantage of naturally occurring control regions taken from bacterial genomes, from bacterial plasma genomes, or from bacteriophage genomes, the bacterial viruses. The elements that regulate these bacterial genes can be used to control expression of any foreign gene. It's not guaranteed you get a lot of it, but you can certainly set it up and express any foreign gene under those control elements. If it's made in sufficient quantities in bacteria, that recombinant protein can be purified, and in fact, the basis of all the commercially viable proteins that are made this way is that they're made in high enough quantities that they can be purified and available in pure form. And indeed, the real benefit here is that they're identical to the protein that was originally natural to, to humans, let's say. And so the recombinant protein can be used to replace the natural human protein, for example, insulin, to treat an important disease, diabetes. And it's real important because it's really important to follow the, that the, the reason the recombinant protein is so, approach is so valuable is that it is the natural human protein. In the case of insulin, before the availability of recombinant insulin, insulin from pigs, uh, collected from pig pancreases, porcine pancreas, was, was used. And that protein, while it's similar to the human protein, is not identical. People who continue to receive this pig insulin throughout their lives to keep their diabetes under control eventually had a response to that foreign protein because it wasn't the same as their own insulin. It had a different amino acid sequence and eventually they would respond to it. Their immune systems would reject it and that would cause problems so that it would no longer be useful. So the human protein is far superior to the previous available uh, therapeutic protein. And so if we go to the final slide here, Microorganisms, like bacteria, are really very useful. They can be used to clone DNA and to express foreign proteins. I've used bacteria as an example, but since the days when E. coli was the pioneering organism and still the most popular organism, any number of microorganisms, other bacteria, yeast, and fungi, as well as multicellular organisms, have been engineered. Indeed, you probably hear a lot of discussion about cloning of uh, humans, and that's a big debate at this point uh, in society. Although cloning of sheep was, uh, was, uh, was done first, and cloning of mice and, and other mammals is certainly uh, has been established as a, in principle can be done. The bacterial plasmids are very highly adaptable. So bacterial plasmids and small circular molecules of DNA from other organisms that can be manipulated are the most useful ways to move DNA around from one organism to another. So gene cloning has enabled scientists to go in and take DNA and basically design it as they see appropriate, whether it's to express a gene, to introduce uh, new features, um, or to make deletions or remove genes. Bacteria, like the E. coli we've used, are the most popular but it's important to keep in mind, as I've already mentioned, that many other microorganisms and actually many higher multicellular organisms have also been used to engineer with gene, with gene therapy, genetic engineering. Recombinant DNA, pro, recombinant DNA methods, as we've used the example, are really very effective ways at uh, allowing a variety of human proteins to be made in a form where they're abundant and they use uh, bacterial control region, control signals. So this is uh, an area that I think is important to understand as so many different types of, of genes are expressed in E. coli, as so many different forms of this method are applied in the laboratory. And these have been coming, I think, in increasing frequency into the courtroom as questions that are debated uh, as to which approach was the similar or different from another approach. And what I've hoped to accomplish in this lecture is 
some basic information, some concepts on how genetic engineering, recombinant DNA, gene therapy are used in their core approaches. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.